So sit down. Sit down. Um, good evening, all of you. So we welcome you all for the fourth lecture of the series on research methodology oriented uh, talks. And uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Jennifer Evans. So she is a non-clinical epidemiologist and the assistant professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she's one of the coordinating editors of the Cochrane Eye and Vision. So we need to know about what is Cochrane Eye and Vision and it's actually an international network of individuals who are working to prepare, maintain and promote access to systematic, uh, systematic reviews of international interventions to treat or prevent eye diseases or visual impairment. So she's here to give a talk on uh, how to write uh, a systematic uh, review or a meta-analysis. Over to you, Dr. Jennifer, for your talk. Great, it's well, a real pleasure to be here. Uh in one hour so what I'm going to do is to give you an introduction uh, to the topic of um, systematic reviews and meta-analysis and also then signpost you to further resources. So um, I'm going to share my screen for my slides um, and hope that works. We are not seeing the screen. Yeah, now it is there. Yeah. 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 Good. So, um, yeah, so my name's uh, Jennifer Evans and um, I'm based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And a lot of my time I spend working with the Cochrane Eyes and Vision Group um, and we publish systematic reviews, mainly on interventions um, for eye healthcare. But there we also do some reviews on diagnostic test accuracy. <clears throat> so before I get going, just to give you some some of the terminology I'll be using, uh, as in all uh, medical research, we're um, mainly working with samples. So um, the issue of random error or chance fluctuations come in. And the main way that in the, in the Cochrane group that we try and assess the role of random error is by making sure that we have confidence intervals around our estimates, which give an idea of where the true um, result might lie. We're also very concerned with the issue of systematic error, which we know can arise during uh, research projects. And the two main uh, sources of bias are selection bias, um, as in who gets included into studies and followed up, and information bias, how measurements are made and the validity of those. And a particular issue in medical research is confounding. And this, by confounding, we mean when the relationship between an intervention and outcome is due to another associated factor. And that's one of the reasons that we focus on randomized controlled trials as a way of evaluating interventions because they're the best study designed to address confounding because if um, random allocation is done properly and you have balanced groups according to covariates then your confounding will be minimized So today uh, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to what exactly is a systematic review and how that relates to meta-analysis and talk a bit about Cochrane reviews, where they've come from and the overall structure of those with a focus on the PCOST framework. We'll then look at some data that you might see if you read a systematic review and um, talk a bit about how to read a forest plot. One of the um, innovations that Cochrane reviews particularly have developed over the years is thinking quite carefully about how to present findings. And if you read a Cochrane review and also other reviews now, you'll see something called a summary of findings table. And we'll talk a bit about 
what's in that and why and particularly focusing on how we make judgments as to the overall certainty of the evidence uh, using the grade approach and emphasizing consistency from the protocol to the conclusions in a review. So what is a systematic review? A systematic review is a review of a clearly formulated question that uses systematic and re reproducible methods to identify, select and critically appraise all relevant research and to collect and analyze data from the studies that are included in the review. And what we're really trying to do here is to minimize bias and improve precision by considering as much information as is available. So systematic reviews and meta-analysis are related. Um, meta-analysis refers to a statistical analysis method that combines the results of different studies. And we often find that that improves the precision of our estimates of effect because we have more data. It doesn't always improve it depending on how much variability there is in the individual studies. But broadly speaking, the aim of meta-analysis is to get a better estimate of the effect. Systematic reviews do not have to include a meta-analysis. Um, for example, sometimes it doesn't make sense to pool data from different studies because they're so different, providing such different results that, and there's so much heterogeneity that it doesn't make sense to produce an average effect. But And sometimes we may do a systematic reviews of qualitative data, so we don't have a quantitative estimate. You could, in theory, do a meta-analysis without a systematic review, but it may be difficult to interpret because you wouldn't really know where the information has come from if you didn't have the systematic review behind it um, in terms of a systematic approach to identifying the data and assessing its risk of bias. So just a brief uh, um, bit of background on where Cochrane came from. Um, Cochrane, as, we, uh, as the introduction said, were, is a, an international network of individuals um, committed to producing regularly updated systematic reviews of interventions for healthcare. And this was inspired by Archie Cochrane, who was an epidemiologist um, working uh, around the middle of the last century. And um, from his work looking at effectiveness and efficiency he, of health systems, he concluded that it's truly a great criticism of our profession that we have not organized a critical summary by specialty or subspecialty adapted periodically of all relevant randomized control trials. So no, he wasn't the only person saying this, but he was a key uh, influencer in this field. And Ian Chalmers, who's a perinatal epidemiologist um, working at the end of the last um, century, um, he really took up that challenge, largely because Archie Cochrane pointed out that actually um, the care around childbirth was particularly, um, uh, there was a lack of evidence base for that. And uh, Ian Chalmers was a perinatal epidemiologist working in that field. And he um, uh, took up that challenge for um, antenatal care and did a lot of um, seminar work there um, De describing the efficacy and the effectiveness of the different interventions. And he then went, went on to inspire um, the Cochrane Collaboration, named after Archie Cochrane. And um, if you have time to read the article here, it's, uh, it's well worth reading. But he um, defined the task of the Cochrane Lab Collaboration to prepare, maintain, and disseminate systematic up to date reviews of healthcare, of randomized controlled trials of healthcare. And when randomized controlled trials are not available, reviews of the most reliable evidence from other sources. So the, the collaboration has been a key part of Cochrane and this has led to an enormous developments over the last couple of decades in evidence synthesis methods and um, particularly culminating in the development of a Cochrane handbook, which is available freely online and um, also working with another network of individuals from the GRADE network, which have been particularly looking at um, how we make, um, draw conclusions from um, medical research and evidence. 
and so those two sources of um, collaboration and um, investigation of how to how to do evidence synthesis has really um, moved on the field considerably in the last 20 years. So coming back to our definition of what a systematic review is, um, it starts off with a clearly formulated question. And one thing that we use um, within the Cochrane collaboration and, and lots of people use it out with the collaboration is the idea of a PCOS framework. So when you're thinking about formulating a question for a systematic review, it's important to clearly define the population, the intervention, the comparator, um, which outcomes are important and which study designs uh, are going to be included in the review. And when it comes to doing systematic and reproducible methods, then a key component of any good systematic review is to prepare a protocol beforehand. So a systematic review differs from a narrative review in the sense that it's a pre-planned piece of work with a question and methods that are set out before you go to the literature. So it's not just a summary of the literature that you find, it's actually a, a new research question and research activity. And so um, for our Cochrane reviews, we publish our protocols on the Cochrane Library. And um, non-Cochrane reviews can also publish their protocols. So for example, there's the Prospero database, which is a database of registered systematic review protocols. Um, many journals now publish protocols for systematic reviews. And um, there's also initiatives such as the Open Science Framework, where you can just um, post uh, your protocols so that they're publicly available and accessible before you start your work. So this is a bit similar to doing a, a randomized control trial. You wouldn't do a randomized control trial without a proper protocol, setting out your methods and what you plan to do. And then when you've produced your final report, people who are reading it can go back to your protocol and check that you did what you planned to do and um, were there any changes, which is important for avoiding bias. So having set out your review question and um, set out your methods, when you're actually doing the review, the um, an important part of it is to identify, select and critically praise the evidence that you're going to consider. And um, there's a, an enormous handbook which sets out all the methods in detail that are recommended based on, um, a lot of it based on empirical research as to what might be the best way of tackling these um, issues and a lot of experience there. So uh, yes, if you're interested in doing a systematic review or want to find out more then the Cochrane handbook, which is available online is a very good place to start. So when we're thinking about identifying uh, studies to include in your systematic review, it's very um, highly recommended to include an experienced medical or healthcare librarian or information specialist on the team. Searching electronic databases now is a highly technical exercise and it's very useful to have someone with expertise on that to advise and help you with that. We recommend uh, the minimum databases would be the Cochrane Central Register of Control Trials, Medline and Embase, but this very much depends on the topic that you're looking at. So other databases might be needed depending on the focus of the review. An important development over the last 20 years has been trials registers and any of you involved in clinical trials will have presumably been involved in the process of registering the trial before you get going. And um, these uh, reports of trials that are planned or ongoing are available on, for example, clinicaltrials.gov or the International Register of Control Trials. Um, WHO maintain a platform of um, all uh, clinical trials registries that you can search. Again, it's quite useful to have someone who's got experience with searching these resources to, to help with that. So um, having done your electronic searches and you've got somewhere between a hundred and several thousand 
references to screen, it's essential to, or recommended to have two authors screen search results independently based on your pre-specified inclusion and exclusion criteria. Again, there have been recent developments in terms of online review management software, which can be very helpful. For example, Covidence, and that can really speed up the process by um, presenting the results of your searches in an uh, uh, easy format and then doing a lot of the consensus uh, between two review authors automatically. And uh, it's very useful to record results in what we call a PRISMA flow diagram. So PRISMA mean, is the preferred reporting standards for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And one of the recommendations is to make it exact, completely clear where you have got all the information from. So um, uh, this example on the slide um, shows how you may report that in terms of what references you identified where and what references were excluded at what stage. And this is really with a view to trying to make what you're doing potentially reproducible by uh, another group or, or so that people can understand what you've done and can make a judgment on um, any potential sources of bias. So having identified um, candidate studies to include in your review, the next step is to critically appraise them. And really what we're trying to do here is to see what the uh, risk of bias, potential risk of bias might be in the included studies. And um, there are several different ways of doing that, instruments to do that with, and um, evaluated tools. So for example, um, a commonly used tool is the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool for intervention studies, randomized controlled trials. And that's quite widely used. But if you if you're looking at non-randomized studies, there would be another um, approach to doing that. And um, what we're trying to mainly trying to do is to assess the whether or not the extent to which we believe or feel that the the effect estimates from that study, how close they are to the truth. And the sorts of biases that are assessed in these various tools are selection bias, performance and detection bias, and attrition bias. So having critically appraised the different studies going into your review, then it's also important to consider what we call meta biases, that there might be studies that haven't got into your review for some reason. And the two um, most important meta biases that um, we come across are selective outcome reporting and publication bias. So selective outcome reporting is where um, a, a particular trial, there's lots and lots of outcomes and they selectively report the ones with positive findings. And the way to guard against that is to have access to the protocol to see what was planned and what was reported. Publication of bias is when negative trials don't actually appear in the literature. And there's um, a lot of empirical evidence to show that this is quite a, uh, a problem. Um, some people argue nearly um, half of trials actually aren't um, published. And that one was one of the um, reasons why the trial registers were developed to try and um, avoid this and so to make sure that every trial that starts out is um, available on a publicly accessible database so that um, people when they're trying to evaluate the evidence can see how many um, whether the results of all those trials were reported. So the reference there is, is quite a useful uh, systematic review of um, evidence for selective outcome reporting and publication bias. So I just thought I'd show you some of the um, data analyses that we commonly see in systematic reviews. And this is a forest plot, which shows the results of a review. In this case, it's um, asking the question um, is, what's the outcome of vitamin E versus placebo in um, people uh, at risk of AMD? or actually people in the general population, whether um, if you take vitamin 
E, are you, um, does it protect you against developing AMD? So in this plot, um, each individual study that um, is included in the analysis is listed on the left-hand side. And then the plot also includes information on the number of people randomized to vitamin E and the number of people randomized to placebo and also the number of people experiencing the outcome, any AMD. The measure of effect here is the risk ratio, which is the probability of um, having any AMD if you take vitamin E divided by the probability of having any AMD if you take placebo. And these risk ratios are plotted as horizontal lines. So the square is actually the estimate of effect and the line is the 95% confidence intervals. And the size of the square is proportional to the amount of information from that study. So the larger studies have bigger squares. And then the um, also included in the plot is a line indicating the line of no effect. So that's where the risk ratio equals one. And um, the results of the meta-analysis, which is the statistical pooling of the data is represented by a diamond. And the width of the diamond is the width of the confidence intervals. So that's how results of um, meta-analyses are traditionally presented in systematic reviews. In Cochrane reviews, they also, there's also a presentation of the risk of bias graphically. So in this case, uh, risk of by, uh, selection bias, detection performance bias and um, attrition bias is presented in these little dots and green largely means there was no evidence of the bias. And then just to make it slightly larger, the results of this analysis, the pooled risk ratio was 0.97, which is pretty close to one, meaning no effect and with the 95% confidence intervals ranging from 0.9 to 1.06. So that's a key information that you need to be aware of and understand from these meta-analyses. So we can also present um, uh, continuous variables. So average effects, in this case, uh, visual acuity. And in this case, um, the measure of effect is the mean difference, which is um, a difference between the average visual acuity in the intervention uh, group, in this case, people who had lutein and zeaxanthin versus people who had placebo. So I'm just going to talk a bit about how we might bring together those sorts of that sort of information into drawing conclusions from the review. And in this case, we draw upon the work of the Grading of Recommendations Assessment Development and Valuation Network, the GRADE Working Group. And um, these methods are not objective as such, they're still subjective methods, but they're trans the aim is to be transparent when making judgments, because quite often it's quite difficult to draw conclusions from evidence um, presented in reviews. And the result of the assessment is an overall judgment of the certainty of the evidence. And this certainty may vary by outcome, depending on which outcome we're looking at. So GRADE has four categories of certainty. High, which means that we're very confident that the true effect lies close to the estimate of effect presented in our review. Moderate, we're moderately confident. And then going down to very low, we have very little um, confidence in the effect estimate. The true effect is likely to be substantially different from the estimate of effect. So when we're working through grade, we assume that randomized control trials are high certainty evidence. And I think we'd all recognize that if you do a, uh, an adequately powered randomized control trial very well, then that would give you high certainty evidence of the effect. But we also know that randomized control trials are not always done as well as they should be. So we might lower our levels of certainty if we identified risk of bias. So perhaps there wasn't masking or perhaps the random allocation wasn't done properly or perhaps a lot of people were lost to follow up, in which case 
we might say there's risk of bias in that those studies. In precision, it might be that the, stud the studies just aren't large enough and so the effective estimate isn't precisely measured enough for us to be very confident about what the effect is. Quite often we find there's inconsistency between different studies and that might also make us less certain as to what the estimate of effect is. And sometimes we might be in a situation where the studies don't directly tell us or give us answers to the question that we've set in our systematic review, but they give us some information. So we might then be less certain because um, the evidence isn't so direct. And lastly, publication bias. So it might be that we have evidence or we know that there's some trials, often negative trials that haven't been published that might make us less certain in the findings of our review. So you can also apply grade to observational studies. And in that case, we assume, because we know that observational studies are often confounded, we assume that they're low certainty. We might be less certain with them, but there are certain situations where we might feel more confident. If there's a very large effect, then we would um, be more certain. So for example, a lot of the work on smoking and lung cancer, well, all the work on smoking and lung cancer comes from observational data, but because it's such a large effect, then we um, are confident that the, the association is real. If there's a dose response, again, it's harder to um, conceive that that might be due to confounding. And so we might um, increase our certainty that way. Uh, or another might be that depending on our knowledge of the area, if all plausible confounding bias would reduce the demonstrated effect, to suggest that, um, that it, that we might upgrade if we think this, that these results couldn't be explained by confounding. So looking at our um, plots before vitamin E versus placebo. So we start with high certainty evidence because they're randomized controlled trials. Um, we don't downgrade because the risk of bias doesn't appear to be much risk of bias in these studies. They were all done well, uh, as far as we could tell. Um, the effect estimate was reasonably precise and um, in terms of consistency, they were all reasonably consistent as far as we could tell. And we did not, were not aware of any indirectness or publication bias. So in this case, we um, decided that this was relatively high certainty evidence of um, a little effect of vitamin E on uh, the outcome, any AMD. When it came to looking at late AMD, there were fewer events, so the effect estimate was more was less precisely measured. So we um, concluded that was moderate certainty, downgraded for imprecision. So we can put all these um, results into a summary of findings table, and um, Largely when we're doing these meta-analyses, we, we tend to focus on relative effects. And, but that's not always what's of interest to um, people making healthcare decisions. So the summary of findings table all, also considers the um, absolute risk. So presents information on what, what would happen in the comparator group, what would happen in the intervention group, as well as the relative effects. And then also presents information on the certainty of the evidence. Um, in this case, this is an example from a different review. We can see a relatively large risk ratio of 3.46, and there was little evidence of risk of bias. So um, we judged in that case that there was high certainty evidence. So um, just one thing to emphasize when you're reading um, systematic reviews and doing systematic reviews, it's important to, that there's consistency from the protocol to the review. So um, using the PCOS framework to structure the review question and then all the pre-specified methods, have they been applied? If they haven't been applied, what you know, what what changed and why? So having a sort of rationale for, I mean, when you're when you're doing a systematic review, quite often you might change um, as you 
evaluate the evidence, it might be sensible to change your approach to analysis or um, the formulation of the outcomes. But it's important to be clear as to why you're doing that and that that's a, a scientific judgment rather than um, a bias. And so those sorts of judgments are, are useful for the review, the reader of the review to be able to see as well. So we would be looking to, to, to make sure that the analysis the summary findings and the abstract and the plain language summary were all consistent in terms of the messages. And it's surprisingly difficult to do to, to keep that, that consistency um, and keep the clear links within the review between all the different um, parts of the review. And it's also when evaluating or reading a review, it's good to consider included and excluded studies and um, what studies have been included in the review and what studies have been excluded. Um, because that um, is where most of the, probably most of the inconsistencies between different systematic, systematic reviews and meta-analyses happen is in terms of what was considered relevant and what wasn't. And have, have you found all the relevant studies that you needed to find? So in terms of further resources, um, I mentioned briefly about the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and that's known as PRISMA. And that's um, a PRISMA statement, sort of similar to the consult statement for randomized controlled trials. And it's just a standardized um, checklist of the sorts of items that should be reported for systematic reviews so that the reader can judge the review properly and understand what you've done or what's been done. Um, there are also, in the same way that we have critical appraisal tools for randomized controlled trials, there are also critical appraisal tools for um, systematic reviews and one that's commonly used is AMSTAR 2 um, and they have a set of seven key domains as to what would make a, a reasonable systematic review, a reliable systematic review and that's quite useful to look at that um, if you ever get asked to critically appraise a systematic review then that um, is a good checklist to use as to how to judge a good quality systematic review or not. Um, this has been a very brief summary of systematic reviews. Um, and there's a lot more um, detail uh, that uh, you may be interested in. There's two sources of training, further training um, Cochrane does a lot of um, interactive training. Um, it's free to people who are doing Cochrane reviews, mainly for uh, free to Cochrane authors, but it's also available on a subscription basis for non Cochrane authors. And then Johns Hopkins University has done um, uh, um, a MOOC on systematic reviews, um, which is free, and that, that would take take you through all the process of doing a systematic review in some in some detail. So if anyone's interested in, in finding out more about systematic reviews, that would be a good place to go. So um, thank you very much. I, I don't know if we've got time for questions. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jenny. Um, are there any questions from here? How about other centers? Um, Dr. Jennifer, I have one basic doubt. I was confused with regards to your first slide where you described between systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So yeah. I presume systematic reviews are uh, includes uh, studies which has got a similar population and uh, whereas meta-analysis uh, does not consider that is that right or uh... um 
Yes, I mean, if you were doing a systematic review, you set out the population that you're interested in. Um, and it can be a very narrow population, or it might be a completely broad, might be all ages everywhere. You know, it's, it, it can be broad or narrow, depending on your what your question is. Um, a meta-analysis is just the technique for actually pooling, averaging the results of the studies. So the, the meta-analysis is, um, I'll just take, go back to here. So this um, slide is, this, this is a meta-analysis, which, which basically means statistically pooling the results of the individual studies. But if, if you just saw this meta-analysis without a systematic review, you wouldn't know where these trials had come from. And you wouldn't sort of know what, what, whether there was a systematic process for identifying these studies and evaluating these studies. You would just see the, the meta-analysis. So um, there's, the, the, the systematic review is the overall um, process and the meta-analysis is the statistical uh, technique for pooling the results. So here it's just a weighted average of the individual study results, weighted according to how large the studies are. So I don't know whether anyone's been involved in systematic reviews at all. Uh, no, uh, here uh, none. Probably at Madurai, there might be a few people who are involved in statistics. Here we have a residence here. They are just uh, starting to write their uh, original articles. Oh, OK. Right, right. So it's sort of at the early stage of um, learning about research and uh, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I think systematic reviews are only as good as the individual um, or the quality of the evidence in systematic reviews is, is very much dependent on the quality of the primary studies. So um, doing good quality primary studies is key to improving the quality of the evidence that we see in the systematic reviews. So, yep. And do people read systematic reviews as part of sort of trying to understand um, intervention effects? When we look at the hierarchy, we know that uh, systematic review is uh, amongst the best of the um, articles that we, that gives the evidence. But um, we do read, but um, we're not involved in any of those. Right. Th um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jennifer, for giving us a brief overview about uh, systematic reviews. Like, um, yeah. um, it was all uh, new to us. So yeah. hopefully with some basic understanding, we'll be able to read those papers uh, with a much uh, better knowledge. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I mean, I, uh, I hope that these um, these resources will will be useful. And um, I was sort of had the uh, awareness that you might be the beginning of uh, um, understanding about systematic reviews. So I wanted to keep it quite um, broad um, rather than getting into too much detail. But um, you know, these these resources on this page will be be very useful for further study. Noted, uh, Dr. Jennifer. Thank you very much. Divya, madam, you want to tell something? Uh, just a quick question. So, uh, uh, the way I understood uh, uh, Dr. Evans, uh, like in the systematic review, what, what is being compared across studies is the aggregated results. Uh, is there a difference when we look at, like, if I had actually pulled the actual data? Uh, will it give a different response, a uh, different uh, analysis result than if I used aggregated data? Uh, yeah, that's a very good, very good question. Um, so when we do systematic reviews, in general, we're looking at published reports. So we only have um, the aggregate summary data. So if we come back to our um, meta-analysis these are all take, taken summary data taken from published reports there is um a field of um an area of systematic reviews which uses individual patient data 
And that's something that, um, particularly in the field of um, cancer, where they do the very, very large studies of um, cancer, where they, uh, the trialists all collaborate and then they can pool their individual patient data to produce um, meta-analyses. And the advantages of individual patient data is that you can be a lot more sure about the quality of the data that you're seeing. So you can do checks on it and you can make sure that um, you can apply some quality assurance checks on the data. But when it comes to, and also then, and then if, um, so for example, for these sorts of study, these sorts of meta-analyses, we're very dependent on what people report in their published reports. So if they might not report an outcome that we're interested in, but they, we know they've measured it, then we're a bit stuck. But if you've got the individual patient data, you can um, have much more um, control over what outcomes you look at. But when it comes to producing the meta-analysis, you still produce, summarize the study level estimates because you want to maintain the randomization. So the, the forest plots would look very similar. It's just that um, the review would, uh, the review authors would have um, more understanding and control of the data that they were putting into those forest plots. Thank you, thank you. Are there any more questions? So there seems to be no questions. And um, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jenny. And uh, we look forward to having um, quite a few more sessions uh, as time goes on. Yeah, brilliant. OK, well, all